Welcome once more to the tutorials on dynamic system modeling and control. Once again, my name is Hossam Fathi, and um, the topic of this particular tutorial is building state space models of very simple electric motor drives. We're not going to go into the modeling of electric motor drives in gory detail. We're also not going to go into the operation of electric motors in gory detail. What I want to do here is I want to make sure that you understand the very basics, the bare bone basics of how to model electric motors and how that modeling effort relates to the operation of electric motor drives. There are three specific goals associated with this tutorial. Number one, to review the operation and function of electric motors from a very high level perspective. Number two, to develop a simple circuit representation for an electric motor. And number three, to plug that circuit representation into um, a bigger model of a an electric motor drive and essentially write state and output equations for the electric motor drive. So moving on to the first goal, reviewing the operation and function of electric motors from a very high level perspective. Uh, I am very grateful uh, to Wikimedia Commons for some of the really nice imagery that they have for real physical electric motors as well as some of the diagrams that they have for um, how these electric motors operate. So these are two images that I've obtained from Wikimedia Commons. The image on the left shows a very simple and inexpensive electric motor. You can see that, uh, that the motor contains essentially a rotor that has coils wound in it. And these coils are ultimately connected to um, rings um, that are on a shaft. You can see that on the right and on uh, on the right in the left figure. And on the in the right hand figure you begin to see a little more of the structure of how this electric motor is built. There is a stator in that image, in that particular image, that has, that doesn't move, that has a north and a south pole. Typically these are, uh, these north and south poles are the north and south poles of either a permanent magnet or um, in other kinds of electric motors other than permanent magnet DC, these could be generated by some sort of a stator coil. But in this picture, there is a permanent magnet motor that sits in the stator and provides a north and a south pole. And then there is a rotor, and the rotor contains coils that are wound in such a way that, um, that they produce their own magnetic field, they produce their own north and south poles, as you can see indicated by purple and um, light red or pink and um, essentially what happens is that the two north poles repel one another when you apply current the two south poles repel one another and as a result you get a rotation of the electric motor the current that flows through the coil is um, pushed into the coil through slip rings as you can see there in orange and these slip rings are then um, basically brushing against carbon brushes or metal brushes that allow them to obtain electricity from the outside. And um, what happens is that with every 180 degree rotation of the rotor, the slip rings are then in contact with uh, you know, the opposite brush. If, they had been in con if one slip ring had been in contact with the positive brush, now it's in contact with the negative brush. So the magnetic field <coughs> excuse me produced by the uh, produced by the, the the rotor is reversed however the rotor itself has rotated through 180 degrees so that the relationship between the rotors north and south and the stators north and south is the same and the motor continues to be pushed and forced to rotate in the same direction so with this in mind, we want to build the simplest possible model of this ideal uh, of this electric motor, and I want to I want to build a model of an ideal electric motor first, and then I want to make that a model of a real electric motor. So I, I want to pursue a few insights related to how this motor works. Now, these insights are based on elementary freshman physics, uh, electromagnetism in particular, and uh, the first thing I want you to understand is that when you pass a current through a wire that is sitting in a magnetic field, essentially the force on this wire is proportional to um, the current that you're applying and also the strength of the magnetic field and also the length of the wire. And if the strength of the magnetic field is provided by a permanent magnet and if the length of the wire is constant, essentially the biggest variable in this, in this equation here 
is the uh, current in flowing through the wire, the force on the wire is basically proportional to that current. Now, if you have two wires that are carrying the same current that are part of a coil, with the current flowing inwards into the slide in one of these two wires and out of the slide in the other wire, you get a torque. And that motor torque itself is going to be proportional to armature current. So the first insight I want you to see as you look at this motor is that the torque produced by the motor is equal to some constant on average is equal to some it varies with time it actually has uh, a sinusoidal pattern with time it does increase and decrease with time but on average the average torque is equal to some constant k sub t times current where k sub t is called the torque constant and it has units of newton meters per ampere so that's one insight i want you to see the second insight I want you to see is that if you take a coil and you make it spin inside a, a magnetic field, say the magnetic field produced by the permanent magnet in this case, then what's going to happen is that there will be a back electromotive force or a voltage generated in the wire that essentially pushes back on you and says, please don't let me rotate. Please don't make this coil spin. Don't make this wire spin. That back EMF if you again go to elementary freshman physics is proportional to again um, on average the strength of the magnetic field it does vary with time it does ripple on with time but on average that back EMF is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field and it also turns out to be proportional to the angular velocity of the coil if the strength of the magnetic field is constant then the insight here is that the motor back EMF is proportional to angular velocity we're gonna say that the voltage that is induced that pushes back and says I don't want to spin that back EMF is equal to a constant k sub b called the back EMF constant multiplied by angular velocity and this back EMF constant has units of volts per radian per second now the third insight is very interesting these two constants the torque constant and the back EMF constant in an ideal motor are equal how do we figure that out? Well, an ideal motor does not dissipate energy. It just converts it from electrical to mechanical. And if it's an ideal generator, it converts energy from mechanical back to electrical. But it doesn't dissipate any energy. The product of torque and velocity gives us mechanical power. The product of voltage and current gives us electrical power. And they have to be equal. And so now, on the right-hand side of this equation, torque is equal to the torque constant times current. So we can make that substitution. On the left-hand side of this equation, voltage is equal to back EMF constant times angular velocity. So we can make that substitution. Now both sides of the equation have a product of I omega, or omega I, angular velocity times current. We can cancel those two and discover that the torque constant and the back EMF constant for an ideal motor are equal. With this in mind, what I've given you now is two relationships that torque is equal to torque constant times current and voltage is equal to back EMF constant times angular velocity. Two relationships where the torque constant and back EMF constant are equal that describe the behavior of an ideal motor. Now, I have never in my life seen an ideal electric motor. It's an artifact that uh, exists on this slide but doesn't really exist in real life. The ideal motor has certain properties that you cannot realize, truly realize in real life. And so the next goal, now that we have reviewed the operation and function of an electric motor from a high-level perspective, the next thing I want to do is I want to develop a simple circuit representation of a real electric motor in order to be able to derive state-space models of electric motor drives. So I want to look at a real electric motor and see what the circuit components of that real electric motor might be. So if I take an electric motor, I'm going to use a symbol that looks like a circle with two rectangular boxes around it to represent an ideal device that fictitiously sits inside a real motor. That ideal device has an angular velocity omega. There is a current I flowing through it. The back EMF, which I'm going to denote by V sub B, is equal to the back EMF constant times omega. And then the torque which I'm going to denote by tau, is equal to the torque constant times the current. And this is my ideal representation of an electric motor. But this ideal representation says that I ought to be able to change the current instantly. 
and therefore change torque instantly. Real electric motors don't behave like that. You cannot change current instantly, and the reason is there's a huge winding, a, a very, very substantial amount of winding inside the motor, and this winding has very substantial inductance. We said in an earlier tutorial that inductance in electrical systems has an analogous effect to inertia in mechanical systems. It doesn't like to see flow change. It doesn't like to see, and inertia doesn't like to see changes in velocity, and inductance doesn't like to see changes in current. The presence of an inductor makes it physically impossible to achieve instant changes in current. So we need an inductor in this electric motor. More importantly, or equally importantly, the ideal electric motor that we just drew um, doesn't have any losses in it whatsoever. It doesn't dissipate energy. It converts electrical energy to mechanical energy with no losses. Now, of course, a real motor has very substantial losses, perhaps, and a lot of these losses are potentially going to come from dissipation in the coil of this motor, from the resistance of the coil in this motor. So basically what I've explained is the fact that a real electric motor can be viewed, perhaps, as an ideal electric motor with an additional built-in resistance and an additional built-in inductance. Now this electric motor circuit is probably connected to an input port that powers it, and I'm going to pretend here that I have control over the voltage at this input port, and that is my input variable. This circuit begins to represent some of the true behaviors of an electric motor, real electric motor, that make it different from an ideal electric motor. A real electric motor has losses, which we're representing by resistance. A real electric motor doesn't allow instantaneous changes in current, which we're representing by inductance. So with this in mind, we've reviewed the operation of electric motors from a very high level perspective with rather substantial simplifications. And we've developed a very simple circuit representation for a real electric motor. The last thing I want to do in this tutorial is to develop a state space model for a simple electric motor drive. The difference between electric motor and electric motor drive is that when I'm modeling a drive now, I'm going to take into account the mechanical side of the drive. I'm going to take into account the bearings, the inertias, etc. So moving on to that, my electric motor drive is going to consist of an electric motor. But that electric motor is going to have a shaft, an output shaft, that is perhaps uh, mounted in a bearing. And that bearing is perhaps going to have some, some, uh, some damping, some resistance to motion. And I'm going to represent that by a linear damping coefficient C. Perhaps that shaft is trying to make an inertia rotate and spin. And perhaps that inertia, uh, the angular moment of inertia of that object that we're attempting to spin is J. And I would like to look at this system now. I would like to declare that its output variable is the angular velocity of the inertia. And I'd like to see if I can write down a state space model for this system. We've already identified the input. It's the input voltage to the mo motor circuit. We've already identified the output. It's the angular velocity of the motor shaft. The next step in the state space modeling process is to identify the state variables. And the question is, what elements are able to store energy in this system? The resistor and the damper in the bearing do not store energy, they dissipate it. The ideal electric motor does not store energy, it just converts it from electrical to mechanical. The only energy storage devices are the inductor and the inertia. Corresponding to the inductor, I'm going to pick inductor current as a state variable. Corresponding to the inertia, I'm going to pick angular velocity as a state variable, which is consistent with everything we've done so far in the modeling of mechanical and electrical circuits. However, notice in these tutorials, this is the first time that we're modeling a multi-domain system where we're actually mixing and matching state variables corresponding to mechanical systems and electrical systems. We talked earlier in these tutorials about how dynamic system modeling is an, a discipline that has applications in many domains, mechanical, electrical, thermal, hydraulic. and one of the most powerful things in dynamic system modeling is that the same tools of this discipline are applicable equally across a lot of domains. And this is the first glimpse you're seeing of that, of how it doesn't matter whether it's a current or an angular velocity. We're still going to write a state equation for it. So I want to move on to writing these state equations. To write a state equation for the current through the inductor, 
the rate of change of current through an inductor with respect to time multiplied by inductance is equal to the voltage across the inductor which means that the rate of change of inductor current with respect to time is 1 over inductance multiplied by the voltage across the inductor but how much is the voltage across the inductor well it's equal to the input voltage u of t minus the voltage drop across the resistor which is equal to resistance multiplied by current through the resistor which is still x1 minus the back EMF that is pushing against you and saying I don't want to spin the motor is telling you I don't want to spin remember back EMF is equal to the back EMF constant multiplied by angular velocity so our first state equation is the di by dt or in state space lingo x1 dot is 1 over L times u of t minus rx1 minus kbx2 now we move on to the state equation for the second state variable angular velocity the rate of change of angular velocity with respect to time is angular acceleration inertia times angular acceleration equals summation of torques so angular acceleration is 1 over inertia 1 over j multiplied by summation of torques there are two torques acting on this inertia one of them is the torque from the motor which is trying to accelerate the inertia and it is equal to the torque constant multiplied by motor current the other um, torque acting on this inertia is trying to slow it down it is the torque from the damper and it's equal to the damping coefficient multiplied by angular velocity so the equation for angular acceleration is that x2 dot angular acceleration is 1 over inertia multiplied by ktx1 minus cx2 finally the output equation is very easy if I'm interested in angular velocity as an output angular velocity happens to be my second state variable so y is equal to x2 this is a fairly simple set of state equations and output equations but what's really profound here is that for the first time in these tutorials we're actually moving across disciplinary domains and we're modeling a, a system that has both mechanical and electrical components seamlessly using a single representation okay so what have we accomplished in this tutorial we've reviewed the function and operation of electric motors from an extremely high level perspective we have swept a lot of the details under the rug but um, what I wanted to do was to show you how to apply the concepts of state space modeling to interdisciplinary multi-domain systems we've developed an equivalent circuit representation for an electric motor containing and in particular the the motor that I sort of used as a reference point for this whole tutorial was a permanent magnet DC motor although the concepts that are presented in this tutorial will translate over perhaps with some changes in details to other kinds of electric motors but we built a very simple circuit representation for a permanent magnet DC motor with um, in a manner that takes into account the ideal behavior of the motor plus some of the real effects that are not represented by that ideal behavior the internal resistance of the coil and of the um, of the um, rotor coil the rotor armature and the internal inductance of the rotor armature and the other thing that we've done is that we've taken that simple model of an electric motor and we've expanded it to include the mechanical components of an electric motor drive thank you very much for watching this tutorial I appreciate it and um, I look forward to the next tutorial with you thank you